Anybody recognize this building here? guesses? It's the one you're sitting in. So just across that way is the Ellington Field where the NASA, NASA astronauts fly their T-38 satellite. Okay, next slide. My name is Chris Twasson and I work up on the fifth floor working uh, Space Shuttle Entry, GN, and C. So I'm going to be talking about uh, engineering for the Space Shuttle today how the space shuttle operates with guidance, navigation, and control. That's uh, the meat of my job. And also try to relate that to vehicles that you're familiar with, like bicycles and skateboards and stuff like that. So we'll see how guidance, navigation, and control applies to lots of things. Before we can talk about what GNNC is, guidance, navigation, and control, it's important to know what engineering is. So what do you think of when you hear the word engineer? That's why I think of when I was your age, I thought trains. I wasn't too uh, uh, aware of other types of engineering. So that's what I thought of as engineers. So there's these types of engineers who drive trains. They're involved with engines is where the word comes from. But the word engine uh, has more to do with ingenuity designing clever things. Engineer, engine. Engineers design lots of things, from engines, paper clips, microchips, space shuttles. <clears throat> so somebody invented the paper clip. As a matter of fact, everything you see, if it wasn't from nature, if it's not something that grew on a tree, or some kind of rock or something like that, or an animal, it started off as the idea in someone's mind. Everything you see in this room, basically, you know, the ceiling tiles started out as somebody's idea. And they're just building on other people's ideas. Okay, so we're still looking at the paper clip. What's different about this one than the other picture? Kind of obvious? Go ahead, say it. Anybody? Bueller? It's floating, right? Paper clip's floating on water kind of neat to know that uh, something that's metal can float on water. So if we study how a paper clip floats on water, is that engineering? An uh, important way to learn what engineering is is to know what engineering is not. So if we can... The study of the surface tension is science. And I'll explain why the, the distinction uh, more as we go along. But there's something here on the paper clip, beside the paper clip itself, there's something else that's been engineered into the paper clip. Anyone want to say what that is? Have you ever had some papers paper clipped together, like you're turning in a project and then the papers fall to the ground? It's like, oh, they just slipped out of the paper clip. I wish a paper clip would hold better. Well, somebody thought that and decided to do these serrations, if you could flip the slide, and designed an improved paper clip that holds papers better. So this is a highly engineered paper clip. So an engineer is a person who designs things that are clever solutions to problems. And these engineered things make our lives easier. Anytime you design something, if you have a problem of, I wish this worked better, and if you come up with a clever solution, you're doing engineering. So you could design engines and build them. Again, it's it's the, the ingenuity involved behind what you're doing that makes it engineering. So there's that kind of engineer that drives the train, but there's also the engineers that design and build the train, and lots of other things that they design and build. From small planes like that little Cessna to large planes like that giant Boeing aircraft. And when you ride a roller coaster, if you can get on that roller coaster trusting that you'll get off it safely, you can thank an engineer because they planned it out and decide, just decided that it was safe enough for you to ride. Uh, people engineer pencils, pencil sharpeners. Does that look like an example of engineering team? Yes, no, maybe? There's the pencils that were engineered, but they're not being used as pencils, so there's not that utility. This is an example of art, is what I would say. 
And have you ever wondered why some pencils are hexagonal? Or have you ever had a round pencil that you put on your desk and it rolls off? Well, someone looked at that and said, oh, you now have to bend over. Well, if I design it with these hexagonal, some of these are round, some are hexagonal, these aren't going to roll off my desk as easily as the round ones. Before rocket ships were engineered, before trains were engineered, they engineered bridges. It goes way back to prehistoric times. Further advancements, the engineer clocks. And then this is from the uh, offshore oil rig museum down in Galveston. I don't know if any of you have been there. <clears throat> Examples of engineering. Here's an example of, that involves fluid dynamics, which we'll get into, because now you're involved in a vehicle that works on a fluid, water in this case. Engineer race cars, or cars that drive up on the moon. New cars, old cars, just like the fastest production car, and made by the same company decades before is the Bugatti. And they're both uh, designed for high performance racing. Here's another span of time that's 500 years. What do you see in that picture? How about in the far distance? Any guesses what that is? It's in Florida. This is the space shuttle on the launch pad. Okay, so it's sitting, it's kind of hard to see because it's obscured by the tower. Um, and this picture was taken in 1992, and they were celebrating the 500th anniversary of what event? It's uh, Columbus's voyage of discovery. Uh, so anyone know the name of any of those ships? That's one. Know the other two? Or which one of these do you think you'd find Columbus on? And that was the Santa Maria, like you said. So yeah, if I was leading the voyage, I would probably want to be on the biggest one. OK, and uh, long after Columbus comes the Wright brothers, and they did their first flight in 1903. 66 years later is probably younger than some of your grandparents. Uh, from Kitty Hawk in North Carolina, 66 years later, they're walking on the moon. Anyone know who this is? This guy is Buzz Aldrin, and the person taking his picture is Neil Armstrong. The first person to step on the moon and the second person to step on the moon. So engineering's been done for thousands of years. You can go back to the pyramids. And we can expect that engineering will continue for many years in the future. Unless you get to a point where you know everything is working just like you like it, pretty happy where it's at, and there's no need to improve. So if you can imagine ever getting to that point, then they might not need engineers anymore. But engineering is the application of scientific knowledge to creatively design devices that help solve problems. So anytime you encounter a problem, if you can think of a device that can help you do it better, and if you design it, then you're engineering. What engineering is not, it's not science, it's not art, but it can use combinations of these scientific and artistic principles in doing the engineering. So we could think of what we could call the four cardinal disciplines. Up on top you have engineering, you have art to the right, science, and philosophy. Um, have you ever had a math test and then you put down an answer Let's say you get the question, what's two times three? And you put down the answer, 12. What's going to happen? What's your teacher going to do to that? Probably mark you wrong because there's really one right answer, one valid answer. And the answer would be six. So when you get that right answer, it's a very precise, uh, mathematics is a science. Now say you go to your art class and you get handed a lump of clay and you're Teacher says, make something out of it. Have you ever been graded wrong on an art project? Saying, no, that's the wrong answer. Your art teacher might come up to it and say, wow, I wouldn't have thought of that. That's very creative. So there's many, many answers. All solutions are valid in art. Engineering is in between that, where there's many solutions, and you could test and find which ones are better. And philosophy, we could get into some other time. 
but we can further distinguish that in the next slide. So basically, this direction, there's toward no flexibility, where there's only one answer, toward unlimited flexibility, and engineering's in between. Or if we slice it this way, we can think of these in terms of being having a focus on nature, whereas engineering and art have focuses focuses on an artificial uh, artifice, or the word art itself probably comes from there. Basically, you're making something. So in between, if you're like in a physics lab, a physicist doing something that has a practical application, like uh, cold fusion, you're working in the lab, you can apply that to getting energy for people. So that's more towards uh, something that's practical. That's called applied science. Now, if you're doing art and that's useful, Let's say you design a chair that you know is real fancy looking, but it's very useful because people can sit in it. That's design, applied art, you could call it. So, what do you think this is an example of? What, what do you think of when you see this? If you were to categorize it. Next slide. Is it engineering? Is it art? Is it science? Next. Okay, it's got little utility as a device, but we can see the subject is from nature, it's human body, so the science of biology, you could say. Um, but you can see the focus is really more on something that's uh, aesthetically, uh, visually stimulating. So we can go ahead and say that it's not engineering, because it's not something that I can't think of how I would use that. Uh, but I'd consider that an artistic display using a scientific subject. So I'd call that art. And next slide. Okay, got something useful, we got a light. But if all I wanted to do was light up my room, I could just have one bulb and brighten up the room, and that would get the job done. So there's something more going on here. It's pleasing to look at. So uh, it's useful, but it's also uh, artistically designed. So that goes into the design aspect of it, between art and engineering, aspects of both. <clears throat> now this is called a ferrofluid, so this is strictly science, studying how a magnet magnetized fluid uh, acts. Okay, what are you seeing here? It kinda looks like a pile of junk, so it's just garbage, none of the above, right? But someone has cleverly designed, uh, cleverly built it and light it up, next slide. So it casts a shadow like that. So what would you call that? Art. OK. There's no focus on nature. It's heavy on form, but there's not really much function. If it was a bench that you could sit on while it did that, then you could say it might be designed. But I don't see any useful practical purpose of it. So that's strictly art is what I would say. Now here's something visually aesthetically pleasing. It's a nice looking bridge. But the focus, next slide, it's on function over form, You're trying to get from one side of the river to the other side of the river. So what would you call this? Next. That would be what I would call uh, engineering. You engineered the bridge. Now you find a bridge here, it looks like a bridge, of, you know, they call them natural bridges. Uh, so is this an example of engineering? Well, there's no manipulation involved. This is, happens naturally. So if you wanted to study that, next slide. That'd be science. So that's geology. Okay. Okay. So this is a crater on Mars. And what would you think this is an example of? I'll warn you ahead of time. This is a trick question. Anyone? Science, art, engineering. If you wanted to study that crater, you'd say science. Just studying and something that occurred in nature. And I want to study that crater. But the trick in the question is, next slide. If you look here, this is actually tracks. And you look right there, next slide. Anyone know what that is? Next slide, we'll zoom in, like really close. It's the Opportunity Rover. So science is being done through this engineering marvel of getting a, a rover out there um, on exploring the crater on Mars. So you have engineering working to help you do science. Next. 
Okay, so bridges, you could say that a lot of engineering is done by copying nature. So you might have been inspired by the concept of a bridge by saying something like this. To build aqueducts. Uh, let's go back for a moment. The arches there, that um, ties into the word architecture. Engineering artificial shelters and other structures. The arch is the stable means for creating vaulted ceilings, buildings. Um, let's think of yourself back in the caveman times. Uh, there's only so many caves to go around, and if they're all filled up and you want to stay dry during the rain, you got to come up with some kind of artificial cave. You might build yourself an arch, put a roof on it, and then you've got yourself a home. Anyone recognize what this is? It's a Stonehenge. Okay, that's Arches National Park. Um, okay, and forward. Arches in a uh, Gothic church. Next. So again, you could think of your house as being an artificial cave. It was built by an architect whose uh, foundation, all the background of that skill comes back to arches. Next. Okay, you ever think of food being engineered? Anyone know why potato chips have ridges? Have you ever been to a uh, party and you take a regular potato chip and stick it in a dip and crack? Well, these ridges help keep make that potato chip stronger. Um, so that it won't break off in the dip. So this is an engineered food product. So you get more strength and hopefully it won't break when you get in the dip. And it's also what gives the strength to a cardboard box. If you just have one flimsy piece of cardboard, it'll just flap around. But if you put that ridge structure here, uh, it'll make it a lot more sturdy where you can build a box and put books in it, but not to taste as a potato chip. We're gonna tie this in next into structures. We're here at Boeing, so we're going to talk about things that fly. Uh, the same principles that go into engineering a potato chip or a cardboard box are used in engineering the wings to, on a space shuttle uh, to make them stronger, or a 747. Next. Ever wonder why biplanes, you know, back in the Wright Brothers through a, um, gener a whole generation of aircraft, can when go through the next uh, Three or four slides. They had the top wing and the bottom wing. But today you don't see these very often. Has anyone here ever flown in a biplane? You, know, you might have flown in a lot of planes, but uh, it's rare to fly in a biplane. So, uh, one of the problems when you uh, have a biplane, well, the reason why they started off with them is because you can make a rigid structure, uh, like building a bridge. They're building a bridge, uh, if you go back to that one, um, so you can make it stronger so the wings will hold up the, in, with the air, except you get a lot of drag when you do that. So they went to one wing to reduce the drag and still get the lift. So it's kind of like the potato chip in making things stronger and more rigid. It's important to have enough strength so your wings don't snap. Next slide. Okay, we can go to the next one. So the same principles that go into building a bridge uh, go into building an aircraft, the structure of it. Okay, next one. Uh, this, this is the inside of a fuel tank for a rocket ship, and they use those triangular uh, structures. Have you ever glued like uh, popsicle sticks together? And if you glue four of them together, they kind of wobble. But if you glue three into a triangle, it's, it's rigid. There's a lot of rigidity in the uh, geometry of the triangle, and that's what they use here. Just a bunch of triangles inside the full tank in the cylinder. Another geometry that uh, they copied is from the uh, honeybees. It has a lot, very low weight, but high stiffness. And this is a um, material that they use a lot in aerospace engineering. It's very stiff, but also extremely light. Next. So we copied the honeybees, and I think this will be the end of the first part of the presentation. And we'll eventually get into how the space shuttle gets engineered. If you can start up the uh, PowerPoint. So we're saying before we talk about GN and C, it's important to know what engineering is and what it isn't. So hopefully you have a better feel for that. And now we can move on to the GN and C part. 
So break down these different functions, stability, control, navigation, targeting, and guidance. And it's all built on the structure next. These are all different basic principles that answer fundamental question, questions that we'll uh, get into. So I'll cover those individually. And why they call it GNC is because they group stability and control together and guard guidance and targeting together. So you basically have guidance and targeting, navigation, stability and control. So G, N, and C. Next. And it all, all depends on your structure. You have to start with a, a, a structure that won't fall apart like the wings. You don't want wings falling off of your plane. So talk about the strength of the vehicle, its tendency to bend and flex, ability to withstand temperature extremes, and once you have a solid structure, then you can work on the uh, guidance, navigation, and control part. Stability is, can I move without braking? That's the basic question you're answering with stability, if you were to simplify it. Control, where, uh, can I change where I'm going? Can I steer? Navigation is, where am I? Do I know where I am, or am I lost? Targeting. Targeting, where do I want to go? So once I figure out where I am, I get, got to figure out where I want to go. And guidance answers, how do I get there? Okay. So that's the whole GMC pyramid, we can call it. And these principles apply to all vehicles, whether it's a simple toy or whether it's as complex as a space shuttle. And I'll show you examples. Like, um, hopefully you'll see that you all, whether you know it or not, that you're all GNC experts if you can like ride a bike, and you can get from one place to another without getting lost, then you're, you're doing GNNC functions. If you can ride a skateboard, or even just walking, I'll show you the dynamics involved in that. Okay, so the, talking about the extremely complex the space shuttle mission, um, there's all these different phases of it, and we break it down into uh, categories. So the next slide shows how that's, how that's broken down. Basically, ascent, on orbit, and entry. Okay? My job focuses on the entry aspect of it. So basically, I start uh, from the deorbit burn. You're already in orbit. The, all those the ascent folks got us up to orbit. On orbit folks have worked all the stuff for uh, going around the Earth. And my focus of the job is uh, to, is to uh, figure out how to get us back. Okay? Uh, Okay, next. And this is the group that I work with. This is me, Chris Twasson, work with uh, two other guys who work on basically all three GN and C aspects. Um, and we work IAV, verification of the software, make sure there's no bugs in the software that it's working properly. So we kind of look at the big picture for entry. But we also have people in our group who are specialists in just the controls, the building control part, the navigation part, or the guidance and targeting part. And Philip Wilson is what we call our subsystem manager, so he's responsible for the whole thing. And so here's a list, you can pull off our website, of subsystem managers, SSMs we call them. And then we can find uh, Philip here, down here. So he's got a little pyramid under him, and all these people have their own groups that they work in, and it all comes together. When you see a shovel launch, you know that's a lot of people working on it to come together, and all the people in this building are just a small part of that, because there's all the other People here in Houston, uh, Florida, California, all kinds of stuff being worked on in Alabama. You can just page through these. So that's where we fit into this big picture here. So our group is just one corner of the fifth floor while all these other people are around. Um, next. So this is uh, Space Shuttle GNNC for orbit, entry, and ascent. Okay, and I could start with talking about stability. Can I move without braking is what we said. Okay, okay uh, do a little demo here. We'll take a can and let's make a prediction. I'm gonna uh, tilt it over, see if you can all see this. And you can tell me whether it's gonna fall over or turn back upright. And, uh, raise your hand if you think it's gonna fall over. I'm gonna let go of it. Raise your hand if you think it's going to come back upright. Okay, I'm going to look at it. And sure enough, it went upright. Do it again. Uh, hands for fall over. 
Okay, I'll see you soon. You have another one. Anyone else is thinking the other way? And uh, oh, yeah, you got it right. Uh, engineers look at that precisely and figure out exactly what it's going to do and why. So let's say this is our can. Okay, it, we can say that each molecule in that can is being attracted by gravity, so it's all being pulled down, and that's the weight of the can. Okay? What keeps it from falling? If I let go of this can, it falls, right? So, if I let go of the can now, why doesn't it fall? Because the table, let's go to the next slide. The table is pushing up on the can and holding it, whether a table's holding it or I can push up on it. So that's called that's what we call the normal force in engineering. Next. Now if you take all those bits of the can that gravity is attracting, we can add those all together and it comes to this center. We call that the center of gravity. Does that symbol look familiar to anyone? You might have seen it on like the crash test dummies, okay? Because that's where they're engineering uh, car safety and they want to see where the center of gravity of, of a human body is affected in a crash. Uh, that's a standard engineering symbol, so that's the center of gravity of this can. So we just basically group all that together. And we can do the same for the normal force. Group all those little forces together into the one force. Next. So it's weight opposing the normal force, and it just sits there. Okay? And we move it out of balance. Okay, if, if we let go of this, which way is it going to go? Hands for upright. Okay. I'd agree with that. Let's see what the slide says. Okay, it's saying that this normal force is pushing on this side of the center of gravity and it's going to tend to rotate about its center of gravity, which causes a torque. That's what the T stands for, and it goes back upright. Okay, next. We call that stable. And if a response to the disturbance moves back toward the original state, that's called stable. Next. Okay, how about here? Let go of this can. Hands for going upright. I don't see any hands. Mine aren't up either, because I think it's going to fall over. What we're seeing here is this normal force is pushing on this side of the center of gravity, and I think it's going to cause a torque that way. Next slide. Okay, the response to the disturbance is away from the original state. The torque is torque that way. Next slide. And it fell. We call that unstable. Next. Okay, stable, the response to the disturbance was back toward the original state. Un unstable is when the, uh, the response is away from the original state, okay? Okay, here's a question. Uh, what's the least number of legs for a stool to be stable? Go ahead. Three. Okay, what were you gonna say? Three, okay. Anyone higher or lower? I'll go with three. We'll see what the next slide says. Three, okay. If you had two, it's gonna fall over. Um, but that third one kind of like catches where it would fall over. Okay, the next slide. Okay, then we're going to get into fluid dynamics. Here our fluid is water, and we have a canoe sitting on there, and a special thing is someone's done something to it. We'll find out later. Okay, so the canoe's sitting in the water. Again, it's, it's rest, at rest there, so the weight of the canoe, next slide, is being opposed by, we called it the normal force when it was a table. Uh, Do anyone know what we call it for a uh, what, what we call that force for a, a boat? Go ahead. Just tell me what you're thinking. Oh, okay, I thought you had an idea. Okay, let's see what this says. We'll call it buoyancy. Okay, have you heard that term? Like a buoy that's sitting out there. If you go out in the bay, you're passing the buoys, they're being buoyed up, and that's buoyancy. So the water is pushing on the canoe, and again, we can add all the pressure from the water into one, a single force at the center of buoyancy, okay? So let's say there's a disturbance, a wave hits the boat, so it tilted over a little bit, we can see that it's torquing the boat back upright. So the torque is in that direction, and the boat rights itself, okay? Have you ever uh, stood up in a canoe? Let's see what happens if you stand up. Well, it raises the center of gravity. All your weight is down higher. Now let's see what happens when a wave hits the boat or if you shake a little bit. Okay, now it looks like the torque is going in the direction of the disturbance. So it looks like the canoe's going to tip over. 
and you're going for a swim. Unstable, not too good in this case, unless you wanted this one. All right. So let's see what this person is doing with this canoe. We modified it to make it more stable by putting outriggers. And the outriggers can make it so stable that you can even ride ocean waves in. Okay, now we're going to talk about the stability of a shopping cart. You ever gone shopping and you think, oh, I'm thinking about the stability of this uh, vehicle here. Probably didn't cross your mind, but the engineer who made the shopping cart did think about it. Okay, the front wheels are very different from the back wheels. Why? Anyone? Okay, we'll find out. Let's see. You push the cart, it goes forward. But, see, these wheels aren't turning, but the front wheels cast it. That's the big difference. And what that creates is a side force in the back wheels where you don't get that side force in the front wheels. They're just going to keep on rolling. And what that side force does is it helps point the cart forward again. Okay? So that's stable. The cart will straighten itself out. But you can try this experiment yourself. You push a shopping cart backwards, the torque is going to go in the other direction, and it'll actually flip itself around and start going forward again. So this same reason that the engineers designed the shopping cart this way is why the rear wheels in your car don't steer. And you can think of the same thing with like a surfboard where you have a fin in the back. That's going to cause a side force that will help keep this uh, surfboard going forward. So now we've gotten into a fluid dynamics example where it's the ocean. Anyone want to guess where we're going next? What do you think you might see on the next slide here? Well, let's find out. Well, look at that. The space shuttle uses the same principle. If you have a disturbance to the side, that tail is back there to help keep it pointing straight. Okay, so you'll get that side force on the tail that acts around the center of gravity to turn you back and point, point the nose forward. Okay? And that aerodynamic force, where in the canoe we had a buoyant force, or in the surfboard it was, again, a, a fluid dynamic force, here is the air that we're pushing on, and it's an aero force that acts around the center of pressure. Where the canoe had the center of buoyancy, all the air pushing on the vehicle acts at a center of pressure. So one thing we look at when we uh, look at space shuttle loads, if it's taking a module up to the space station, if they put that module too far back, then that's like standing up in the canoe, and we could get into an unstable situation. So we don't we want to avoid that. The next slide shows the exact limits that we designed to. That we can't have the excursion of the set where the center of gravity is further than that much. It's really tight tolerance in Y. That's what we call the um, axes, X and Y. We'll get a little more play in X. <clears throat> so we can go to an even more basic uh, example. Let's uh, consider the dart. You know, we talked about the shopping cart. Uh, um, if you push it backwards, it'll straighten itself out. So if you don't believe that, you can give it a try. And here, what we're going to do, um, would someone like to volunteer for a dart experiment? If you'd like to do it, come on up. Got a dartboard here and a dart. OK, this experiment is kind of sharp, so be careful. We'll throw this dart backwards, OK? So we'll throw it backwards at the, at the board, and let's see what happens. Why don't you come back further? <clears throat> Let's try it from here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let me, let me just see one. Maybe we really have a broken dart or our engineering principles aren't working. Oh, look at that. I threw it backwards, flipped around, and stuck in the void. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks. Okay, let's see what happened there. We'll look at the engineering analysis of that. So the fins are back there to keep the center of pressure, get a lot of drag on the back, get the center of pressure back, and then the weight's on the front to keep the center of gravity forward. Now if you throw the dart backwards, you have a situation where it's very stable and it'll actually flip around with that torque pointing it straight. 
Okay, so that's stability, and let's talk about control. Um, once you know you can move without braking and that you operate in a stable way, then you want to be able to change how your uh, where your vehicle's going. So in the shopping cart, you do that manually by pushing it. In a car, you do that manually through next slide, the steering wheel. And that's your control. Okay. Uh, walking, talking about how the um, how your GNC experts just from being able to walk uh, someplace without getting lost. Well, the, st the stability and control parts of it, uh, walking, for me to just start walking, what I'm doing is I'm breaking my ankles and the center of gravity is going to cause me to fall forward. So it's basically fall, catch, fall, catch. If you go through the slides, it's just a series with a normal force. Oh, go back one. So that's just a series of falling and catching yourself. That's called dynamic stability. Because if I were to try to stop at any point, I'd probably fall over if I tried to hold that. But if I'm walking and moving, then it's easy. Dynamic meaning motion, OK? Uh, same thing for a skateboard. Would someone like to come up and do a skateboard demo? Any volunteers? Anyone ride skateboard? OK, come on, give it a try. Go forward a little bit. Sure, just hop on and roll. All right. Thank you. Now, see how he was leaning to the right? Now, if the skateboard wasn't moving, you just fall over to the right. But what happens is the wheels start turning. Let's go to the next line. <clears throat> so he was falling over to the right. The wheels turn to the right. Next line. And the board comes to the right. So the board is basically catching it. So it's like fall, catch. So um, imagine if the engineer designed these wheels to turn to the left when, you're, when your center of gravity went to the right. <coughs> Next slide. If it went the other direction. Next. Skateboarding probably wouldn't have become very popular. Everyone would be falling all the time. Okay. So you end up being dynamically balanced. That normal force ends up staying underneath you and it's basically catching you. And you can say the same thing. Next slide. <clears throat> it's actually easier to, to uh, stay on the board while it's moving instead of trying to balance it. It's like uh, riding a bike. Have you ever tried to sit on a bike on the two wheels just without moving? It's really hard. You've got to be extremely good at balancing. I've seen it done, but uh, it's a lot easier when it's moving forward that you can dynamically balance. Okay. So, when your center of gravity moves to the left, the wheel turns to the left, and the bike comes back underneath you, falling and catching. Okay, next. Okay. Who would like to do a stick demo, balancing a stick? Okay, you, you're <laughs> our demonstration. For, okay, how about some of them? Some of you. All right, what I'd like you to do is balance the stick on your hand and see if you can keep holding it up. All right, look at that. Now try to do it, yeah, just like you're doing. Now just hold your hand still and see how long it will stay up. It's going to fall over, OK? Thank you. So did anyone think you just saw a demonstration of rocket science? Uh, it's child's play, right? It's just holding up a stick. But it actually does relate to rockets, and we'll see how. Uh, if you want to keep the rocket, in this case it's a solid rocket booster, an SRB going forward, if you, the disturbance goes to the left, what happens is these nozzles are gimbaled so that it'll push it. It's just like balancing it with your hand. Okay? Next slide. And on the space shuttle, you have five gimbaled engines for launch uh, two gimbaled solid rocket boosters, and then the three gimbaled. SSMEs, Space Shuttle Main Engines, these three here. And these other two small engines are gimbaled also. Those are the orbital maneuvering systems to get you back down to Earth. Next. So you can see that if uh, going in one direction and you want to keep pointing forward, 
gimbal, or you can use that to steer. Next. Okay, going back to our question about the, the um, stool, uh, if you were to say what's the um, least number of uh, wheels to uh, keep like a vehicle stable just statically, a bike, if you try to hold it stable, it's going to fall over, right? So you might say a tricycle, which goes back to our answer about the three legs on the stool. But uh, you probably all seen a Segway, and kind of like a bicycle, you have two wheels and it's all balanced. If you, if you in introduce dynamic balancing, you go to the next slide, you might say the answer for the least number of legs on the stool is one, if you were to somehow have some mechanism that could balance it. Okay, and there's, that's done manually in the next slide with people who ride unicycles, okay? So the unicycle is similar to a rocket in that you're uh, holding that uh, balance. It can be done aerodynamically with the fins steering you or then gimbling the engines like we talked about. Uh, going back to what Mark was saying with, uh, go back one, the um, rocket that uh, John Glenn rode, the Atlas, had these Vernier engines to help it steer. Okay? And if the steering brakes, then things go unstable, and this is a corkscrew out of a missile test. Okay, this is that man he was talking about, Robert Goddard. And this is back in 1926. Next slide. This rocket did this up in Massachusetts. Um, only reached 41 feet high. Wouldn't even make it to the top of this building. Okay? Now, this was 1926, which was 23 years after the Wright brothers, and only 43 years to go from this first, very first, world's first liquid fueled rocket to the rocket that went to the moon. 43 years. That's less time than I've been around. Okay? Now, for entry on the space shuttle, you get back into the air and you can start using aerodynamic control surfaces. So just like an aircraft will control in pitch, up and down, or the rudder in yaw, or the ailerons in roll, the space shuttle has similar controls, but when you're up in space, uh, it's called space because there's so much space between the molecules, it's essentially a vacuum, you, you, don't, you can't use that to control while you're in orbit. So the space shuttle has different uh, things to, next slide. We have reaction control jets. So you can see here in the front, the reaction control jets can push the nose up, down, in other directions. And then there's also jets in the back that can maneuver from the back. So that's where the jets are located. Okay, next slide. Okay, so that's, uh, Control. Let's move on to the next topic. The question here is, what does the space shuttle have in common with dolphins and bats? Any guesses? Okay, next slide. Kind of an odd question. Let's see what the answer is. Well, that brings us into the topic of navigation. Answering, where am I? Okay, the dolphins and bats, you know, they use things like echolocation, sonar for the dolphins, um, next slide. Well, the space shuttle uses a lot of different sensors to determine where it's at. And next slide will show how many of these sensors. You probably recognize this here, GPS. Anyone know what GPS stands for? You probably get to play with them in your car, global positioning system, or you might have it on your phone. Um, they're basically using a similar principle of navigation that those animals use. Um, through the time it takes to send and receive the signal, you can tell how fast that signal is traveling, and if you time the difference between the send and the receive, you'll know the distance. So that's how those basically operate. Let's say we're driving through Texas, and we have a transmitter in Dallas, and we know when that signal comes out, and we can tell exactly how far away we are from this transmitter. Well, that says, if you go back, um, that says that we're this far away, but it's not too helpful because it could be anywhere on that circle. We just know that one distance. But if we have a second transmitter, then we know uh, that we're either 
at this point or at that, that point. Um, next slide. And if we had that third transmitter, we could say our position has been triangulated. So we know we're right there in the middle. Um, do any of you, have any of you used your uh, cell phones, like a map, moving map function to see exactly where you are? There's a couple ways to do that. Um, the way, one way is your cell phone is getting signals from three different cell phone towers and knows the distance or the time delay that, from those signals. So it says from between these three towers, I'm at that point. The other way to do it is through a GPS satellite, and that's what the shuttle uses. Um, next slide. So now we're in three dimensions. You can't say that you're on the surface of the Earth when you're in the space shuttle, because you could be at any altitude. So for, with just one satellite, that would, and you know the distance you are from that one satellite, that puts you anywhere on that sphere. And if you get the signal from a second satellite, well, you're anywhere from on that sphere, and you get the solution between the two of them, and now it becomes a circle. <coughs> Next slide. And if you get a signal from a third satellite, that circle collapses down to these two points. And what we need is the fourth satellite to tell us exactly where we are. That's generally how GPS works. On uh, targeting, where do I want to go? Okay. So there's. Uh, four fundamental types of targeting, which we'll get into next. Next one. Uh, you can have intersecting trajectories, paths, um, that they basically match the same point in space. Um, go back. The intersection is not all that useful, but there is one uh, example I could think of. It's like if you're trying to catch particles from a comet, which they did, and the, they brought a sample back to uh, the Space Center several years back. So you basically go to a point where the comet tail was. So you're intersecting the trajectories. So you catch the dust from the comet. Other than that example, I can't think of too much useful applications for it. The next one is a little more complicated. You go to the same point in space, but you do it at the same time. And this is a very basic thing, um, a problem that there's government spends billions of dollars trying to solve, uh, basically like if you're trying to defend the country from incoming missiles, ballistic missile defense is the biggest example of uh, interception. So you want to get to the same point to uh, 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 hit the missiles. Okay, the next step is rendezvous. You get to the same point in space and time, but you match the speed and direction, so you're flying together. And that's a photo from the very first time this was done in space. Uh, it was Gemini. Uh, 7 mission was launched, and then the Gemini 6 mission came up to meet them. And so they got patriotic with that, they called it Gemini 76. And that was done back in 1965. The next one is docking, where you get all the way to the point of rendezvous, so you're next to each other, and then you go and actually contact and connect the two spacecraft. So does anyone know the name of the astronaut who piloted the first orbital docking? This was the mission right after that last one. Anyone want to guess? I have a big hint there. It's also the first person to step on the moon. Go ahead. Uh, John no, he was the first American to orbit Earth. It was Neil Armstrong was the first one. He was in that picture a while back in, that you can see in uh, Buzz Aldrin's visor. Okay, so he was the first person to do the uh, first orbital docking. Now, for every mission the space shuttle goes to the space station, it involves doing a rendezvous and docking. You've got to get connected to the space station to match those paths. Next. But even after leaving the station, uh, the, the orbit burn requires precise targeting in order to make it back to the proper landing site within the limits of what we'll call guidance. I'll explain that here. Which is basically answering the question, how do I get there? I know where I am. Navigation told me where I am. I know where I want to go. I want to go land on the Kennedy Space Center runway. Targeting tells me that. Or Edwards if the weather's bad at uh, Kennedy. So guidance is trying to solve the problem. How do I get from being over 200 miles high in altitude and in speeds higher than Mach 25 down to zero altitude and zero airspeed on the runway? Okay. 
So we're going to use an analogy to try to give you some kind of feel for how guidance uh, solves that problem. So say you had to drive to Houston in exactly one tank of gas, and you had to arrive, let's say you're driving to your driveway, and you had to pull into your driveway exactly when the fuel load light came on, okay? Not too much, um, not with too much fuel. The analogy here is that the gas represents your energy, all that speed and altitude that the shuttle carries. You're trying to burn all that off, but you can't have too little, otherwise you'll run out and you'll fall short. So you don't want to fall short, but you don't want to come into your driveway with too much gas either, okay? So that's the analogy. Um, it's kind of a loose analogy, but it might give you a feel for, for the principles of guidance. So say we start out in San Antonio, if you go back one. Say you start out in San Antonio and you do your calculation. If, you have, if your car has a little uh, trip computer, you might be able to figure this out better. And the shuttle has computers calculating stuff too. So you figure out that, okay, that's gonna be about right, but if you think um, I'm gonna get there with too much gas, one way to solve that would be to start, do your fill up earlier. Or, next slide, if you think you might get there with not enough, fall short of your driveway, do that fill up later, okay? And there's, um, that's like saying, well, let's just go ahead and press on, next. Um, but then again, if you miss that calculation, um, say you started, say you needed to do your fill up earlier, and then you misjudged it by a little bit, there's some disturbances going on, something that affected your calculation, like you get stuck behind the traffic or whatever, um, something you didn't plan for. Um, there's really not too much you can do to correct for that because you're on this straight line. So there's another way you can account for that. You can plan to have um, a longer path. That way, if you find out you're, you're getting short on fuel, you just cut your path short. I'm just going to pick a shorter route. I, I miscalculated, so now I'm just going to uh, correct for that. And if you find out you have too much, you can always take a longer route. That's an easier uh, solution to do. Okay, next. So you basically have those two things to play with. And then the shuttle's orbiting the Earth. We can choose where we want to do our deorbit burn, which is usually like halfway around the world from where we want to land to. So basically come around 180 degrees from uh, Florida and say that's where we want to do our deorbit burn. And you can tweak that um, or sooner or later on the, on the orbital path. And you plan, next slide, to do these turns to make a longer path. And when we do our approach into uh, Kennedy Space Center, we plan to do a long turn to set up for the runway. So that if, when it comes down to the end and we see that we're getting, we're getting low on energy, we'll just cut the corner and we'll do what's called a straight in maneuver to the runway. So you can play with those variables um, to adjust your um, guidance. Okay? So that's basically the end of the presentation. Here's the astronauts in orbit getting ready to go out on an EVA, extravehicular activity. Here's a speed limit of orbital velocity. Anyone have any questions? You know, covered a lot of stuff. A lot of these things I talked about, I didn't understand or learn until I was like past college in grad school. So many school years after where you're at. But um, hopefully I tried to, uh, hopefully I was succeeded in getting it to uh, where you can relate some of the guidance, some of the shuttle engineering principles to things that you do, whether it's riding a bike, riding a skateboard, or something as simple as walking home from school or something like that. Did you uh, want to jump in, Wayne? Oh, with this? Yeah. Well, the, the uh, Oh, yeah, we just send them upstairs and then you can do it up there? Yeah. Yeah, that might work better. Or after that. Okay, uh, let's see where we're at on time. Okay, uh, if you guys flip through the next couple of slides. Uh, okay, so I think this is John Young on the moon. In Apollo 16. Anyone notice anything uh, out of something that looks a little different from the, in this photo? You're nodding your head? What did you see? Well, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so here's a guy, he's just hanging out up there. Uh, let's go back one for a second. What you see here is look at the shadow. If you watch the video of this, John Young's actually jumping up in the air while he's saluting, so he's stuck up in the air. But this is dynamic 
and you, the next moment he'll be falling back down. Next slide. And he's been held up there statically, so it looks like magic, right? Anyone have any idea how this got done? Any guesses? What I'm thinking is that there's a big metal rod coming out of the building and through his clothes, maybe onto a harness or even holding his feet steady to help with the illusion that's helping him to pull this trick off. So someone engineered a, a magic trick or a stunt. Um, so hopefully this talk today gave you a better feel of what engineering is versus other things and an idea of what we do as engineering um, space shuttle uh, missions. I had other stuff on there, but I think we're getting short on time. So we'll just send you upstairs for anyone who wanted to learn about the International Space Station. That's back up in the same room that Mark had you up in uh, 5100. So if you'd like to do that, uh, thank you for coming today.